last video I ranted about why you should learn to sew. And so I figured it would be a good idea for this to be a sewing tutorial. So the project that we'll do today is a hat, uh, one of the, the floppy Santa Claus type that is based off of, or is a pro popular reconstruction of a hat that was found uh, in uh, one of the graves in Birka. Um, and it's, it could be of Slavic origin, it could be Hungarian origin. Um, and it's basically, the, the whole thing was reconstructed off of one single metal chape that was found. They didn't actually find any, any textile, or if they did, it was, it was a very small amount. Uh, and it's just this one little metal piece that goes at the end of the hat. And the popular reconstruction of it is actually this big floppy Santa Claus style hat. Um, Personally, I think it would actually be more similar to a four-panel hat or something like that that comes to a point that had that on the top, uh, similar to some helmet designs of the time, um, especially from uh, where a lot of the, the people were sta who were stationed at Birka were from. Uh, but that being said, the shape was found down by the neck of the person in the grave, and again, you know that that sort of points to a lot of people saying that it you know oh it's it's this this type that uh, it has to be a floppy hat that that dangles down and, and whatever. Um, but I also know that things sometimes move around in graves as the body decomposes, um, and so it's not completely unheard of for something to move you know it's eight inches, nine inches down, ten inches down. Um, because as the as the hat uh, as as everything rotted away, it could could have migrated a little bit. Um, same goes for as they were burying the body itself, you know, throwing the dirt in and everything. The hat could have slipped off and, and moved. So who knows? But popular reconstruction. Uh, so basically, what you'll need for this part of it uh, is paper, uh, preferably big enough to do the whole pattern, uh, but you know, that you might not have something big enough, so uh, in that case, just pieces of printer paper taped together work pretty well. That's what I have to use this time. You'll also need a cloth measuring tape. Uh, that's so that you can take accurate measurements of your head, because there's no point in making a hat that doesn't fit. Uh, you'll need some kind of a ruler. Um, I'm using this one just for the sake of, um, you know, it's easy to keep square and it's convenient. Um, and obviously something to draw with uh, if you aren't 100% uh, confident in your, your drafting skills you might want to use a pencil uh, I'm just going to use a pen and then uh, you'll need pins to attach it to your, your fabric um, I forgot to mention in the video before pins can be gotten at the dollar store as well uh, you don't need anything fancy it literally just has to be a sharp piece of metal that you can stick through fabric um, so some people prefer the uh, the more fancy dressmaker's pens with heads on them. Um, I've always just used the regular metal headed pens for the most part and they work perfectly well. Um, you'll also, for fabric, uh, you'll need a big enough section of a lining fabric to do two pieces for the halves of the hat. Um, you'll need some kind of a fabric for the outside, preferably wool, uh, preferably something that sort of fits in the time period you're going for if you're going for a period design or a period pattern um, if you're just making it because you like that design of hat that's cool do whatever you want um, but make sure that if you're going for it uh, for period make sure that it fits in those guidelines um, and wool is is the best uh, and if you're making a summer hat then you could get away with uh, making it out of linen um, then you don't have to line it so that's that part of it. Um, the shape for the end of it, uh, in another video I'll show you how to make one. Um, it's a fairly specialized thing. Uh, they're not exactly because the original one was cast. The ones that I do sometimes um, are basically cut out of sheet and then formed. Um, if you're looking for one that's exactly an exact replica, there are a couple sources. The one that uh, comes to mind right now is a company based out of the Czech Republic. 
uh, called Wolf Lund. So I can post a link in the description. Um, so beyond that, uh, you'll need a needle and thread if you're doing it by hand. If you're doing it by machine, you'll need uh, whatever goes along with the machine you have. Uh, usually just a spool of thread of a complementary color and stuff. Um, but this will this project will involve if you're doing it by machine, uh, it'll involve some machine, and then it all has to be hand finished so that there's no visible machine stitches. Um, and then the last thing you'll need is a piece of fur that is big enough to do a one inch strip around the, the bottom of the hat. Um, oh yeah, and a, and a piece of uh, the same dimension uh, plus a seam allowance of fabric. Um, I would recommend uh, adding half an inch to each dimension so that when you can, you can tuck each thing under a quarter of an inch when you stitch it on. Uh, that will be hand sewn to the back of the uh, the strip of um, fur to support it so that when somebody puts it on their head, if, if their head is just a little bit too big, it doesn't just burst the skin of the fur, which can be kind of a pain to fix because when you do that, it makes it that little bit smaller so that it doesn't fit as well and everything. So a uh, piece of your liner fabric will do just fine. Um, doesn't have to be anything in particular. It's not going to be seen. Um, so to get started, I'm going to adjust the camera down and I will show you how I draft the pattern for this project. Actually, the first thing I want to do is get um, some measurements of my head uh, so that we know exactly the dimensions to make. So you get it sort of where you want the brim of the hat to sit. Um, in this case, I think I want to go around my ears and down to about the tops just above my eyebrows. Um, and you pull it fairly tight but not, not too snug. Uh, and that is 23 and a quarter. And then for the, um, the dimension for how long you want it, uh, it's a good idea to take a measurement from sort of where you want it to sit up over your head and then down. Um, that's about 17 and a half for me. Um, I'm probably going to add an inch, then that would be 18 and a half. And the inch is just so that when uh, it has the extra fabric that it has to go over and for that curve of the fold, so it doesn't hang too, too high or too, too low. Um, so that's just a, a simple measure to add. So it's, uh, it sort of adds a buffer. So now we can actually get started on drafting the pattern. So because I don't have a piece of paper big enough, I taped two together. Uh, and then the first thing that I want to do is actually fold it in half. And that way I can get a nice symmetrical uh, pattern and try to get at least one of the ends as tight as possible so that you um, have the room to do it. So to start off, uh, the distance around my head was 23 and a quarter. So I divided that by two. So uh, then you end up with 11 and 5 eighths. Divided by two again, because now I'm working at a quarter of the pattern, uh, I got five and three sixteenths, or 13, five and 13 sixteenths. Um, so then I just rounded that to five and three eighths just because it's easier to add. And then I added my uh, three eighths seam allowance because here I don't I only have to add it one time because it's not a double measure uh, and then I get six and a quarter so I'm hoping <laughs> yeah I'll have to add paper cool so I have to add paper um, to get my proper dimension. Which is pretty easily done here because I just butt the two pieces of paper together. Slap on a piece of tape uh, near near the bottom of it. And it doesn't really matter how 
square this edges entirely uh, just because you're going to be you can buck this thing up against a square edge on your fabric um, or you just make sure you cut a square line. Um, I can drop the ruler on it and use the rotary cutter. Um, if you're cutting with shears you just have to make sure that your uh, your line is as square as you can get it. Um, and then now to get the other side I just flip paper over and tape that. doesn't matter that's folded here, it's going to be cut. So. So now you have this monstrosity taped up. So now it's uh, six and a quarter from this fold, and that should give me my nice uh, square lines and everything. And the other dimension, uh, I figured I could get away with just um, I could get away with just going to 17 because that's what my paper ended up being instead of adding another whole sheet of paper for just an inch uh, because it's, it's a length of a floppy hat that just sort of dangles over it's not that big a deal so now I go from the mark here to that corner um, actually one thing I can do to help the process a little bit is mark out from that corner three-eighths of an inch so that way I can actually sew up to the corner and it, it'll, uh, it'll give me a little bit of a seam allowance even though I'll probably end up stopping just shy of it so that when it's uh, so I can trim away this corner a little bit and that, that way I actually have some meat still there uh, that part of the seam is going to be protected by the shape so it shouldn't be too much of a problem in the future but you just want to eliminate as much of the problem as possible and now this is where having a nice long ruler uh, comes in handy. You can get, uh, if you don't have one of these, you can get a 24 inch uh, metal ruler for relatively inexpensive. And then trying to scribe the line across the tape because the pen obviously won't write on it very well. So now you have your, uh, your line drawn here. And one of the things I like to do to add a little bit of dimension to it is actually come off of here and kind of give it a little bit more of a round profile. I find that if they're too triangular and square, it looks kind of dumb. Um, and then one thing I like to do too is actually curve in at the bottom here fairly tight so that it's almost uh, like a rim. I think it's a part that goes almost vertical here so that it's nice and tight. Um, and now you just cut out the pattern. The other parts of the hat, uh, being the, the strips, you can fairly easily either cut them out with a uh, rotary cutter and a ruler and just get them done that way, or you have to dry out the pattern, but they're fairly, they're fairly simple because they're just rectangles. Uh, the just keep in mind that if you have a one inch strip for the fur uh, you want to have a one and a half inch strip for the liner part for the fur so that when you fold it over you don't have any ragged edges sticking out um, and so that it's the it's the the fabric part that actually folds under and not the fur folding And then you can even kind of round this section a little bit too. So now you have the pattern piece for half of the hat. And so you want to cut you want to cut two of these in your outer fabric, and you want to cut two of them in your liner fabric. Um, and then you want to sew the uh, the two halves together. And that, I think, is basically where we'll stop today. Um, so I'll cut these out, 
and then I will show sort of how to sew the two together. So to anyone that is completely new to uh, working with textiles, um, one thing that you really want to do is iron the fabric before you go to make anything from it. Get it all the wrinkles and everything, that way it will A, be easier to sew together because you don't have it crimping and stuff in different positions. Uh, the other thing is when you lay out the pattern, your pattern will obviously lay out more accurately. Um, I don't actually currently possess an iron, so that's a little uh, past me right now. Um, but because this is just the liner part, and this is really the only fabric that I have that does this, um, it's actually uh, silk from, from old curtains. Um, I just kind of go with it. It's, it's uh, a part that actually isn't going to be seen, so it's not as big a deal. Um, but it would be nice to, to iron and flatten it out. And right now I'm actually going to cut out um, what's technically more than what I need because it's four, right here it's four layers thick. There's a layer, uh, two layers of silk and two layers of linen. Um, I like to put silk inside the hats just because it doesn't mess up your hair as much as the cotton based liner would. And so, if you've never pinned a pattern down before, you kind of want to make sure that you've got it nice and flat without shifting it around because if you shift it around obviously your uh, design won't be on there accurately because it'll have shifted too much. And you also want it to go with the fabric. Um, because this way and this way, the fabric doesn't really stretch very much. Um, I don't know, eh, silk sort of does stretch in the bias. But you have the warp and the weft going perpendicular to each other, crossing around, uh, looping over each other to create the fabric. And so on most fabrics, there's not much stretch in either direction that way. But fabric stretches on the, what's called the bias, we're actually pulling diagonally across it and the fibers can slide. And so you want to cut things out with the grain of the fabric so that it doesn't have the opportunity to slide. And if you cut one half uh, on the bias accidentally and not the other half, it will actually um, be a royal pain to, to cut out or to, uh, to sew together because the two halves won't want to go together properly. So I'm gonna finish uh, pinning this out I'll cut it out, and then we will sew. So obviously hand sewing would be a lot more authentic, but in this case, um, you know, in this particular one, it's just, right now it's just a liner, so it doesn't really matter too much. And I'm mostly of the opinion that uh, unless it's a piece that either you're doing for the pride of doing it 100% authentically, um, or it's a piece that's going to be uh, critiqued. Uh, it's going to be critiqued, totally do it, all authentic. Um, but in my opinion, for general reenactment, if it, if it looks, uh, if, if it's just for like a, a costume that you wear for events, uh, if it looks authentic and you, you, know, you don't see visible machine stitching on the outside, it's good enough. Um, some people are very much into making it 100% uh, the old ways, and that is great. Uh, but sometimes doing it this way works just fine. Uh, so I apologize if this gets a little bit noisy. The motor for this machine kind of growls a little bit. So here we go. Uh, basically, you want to do straight stitch forward for just a few stitches uh, so that you can uh, lock it in. And to lock it in, you either, in this case, use the, uh, the back stitch lever, or if you're using a machine that stitches forward only, you lift the presser foot and then back tack over that way. So just back along the same line. And then basically, you want to just stitch 
following whatever your uh, your seam allowance is. Uh, some machines actually have guidelines. Mine doesn't. Uh, I generally use the width of the foot, which is in this case three eighths. Um, same for if I'm doing zigzag. I still use that so that it'll actually be to either side of that by I think it's about an eighth of an inch or sixteenth of an inch. Um, and because of the way this is cut, there is a little bit of wiggle room. Uh, there's a little bit of stretch in it because it is sort of cut on the bias. So if things aren't lining up perfectly, you can kind of tug them around to try to sort of cheat it into position. Sometimes it's nice to just use the hand wheel to sort of uh, slow it down a little bit and that way you can actually kind of bring things around. Another thing you can do is leave the needle pushed in and uh, lift the presser foot. Uh, in this case I actually have a little bit of a lifter under there that I can operate with my knee. Um, then you do a couple of stitches leaving the needle in, lifting the presser foot, just shifting it slightly. kind of dragging around a little bit. Um, and I have gotten fairly good at pulling the fabric around with one hand and that comes from my days using that uh, hand crank machine. So now you sew down the other side making sure that you have the two pieces of fabric lined up and that it lines up with your uh, with the side of your foot or the line that you're using. the end of your thing, at the end of your, uh, your stitch, you use your back stitch just to lock it in. And you never want to actually sew fully over the end of your, uh, your fabric. You always want to have something between the uh, feed dogs here and the bottom of the foot so that you don't dull the feed dogs. Uh, if you dull the feed dogs, they don't draw the fabric in properly and then, you know, then you have to replace your feed dogs. So then you just use your uh, scissors and just trim off the extra fabric or the extra thread, uh, leaving you know a decent tail hanging out the back so that you don't uh, uh, you don't accidentally have it pull through the needle. So once you have that, uh, you then move on to the other the other one, which is the uh, the outside, and you stitch those. Uh, then the, in the next video I will show you how to stitch them together, how to cut out the, the fur and sort of ready that, and then how to attach the fur. And after that it's just a matter of either making the shape for the end or buying it. Thank you for watching. Uh, if you like what you see please don't hesitate to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments please leave them below. The link to the shape for this hat uh, that's available from Wolfland is below. Um, and I created a Facebook like page for my channel. Uh, if you're on Facebook, uh, please look it up. The link is below, or you could search uh, Thorbjorn Jorkelson. Thank you.